What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Joshua Wolf Schenk. He's the author of Lincoln's Melancholy, How Depression Challenged a President and Fueled His Greatness. So welcome to Madness Radio, Joshua Wolf Schenk. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really interesting to read your work about Lincoln's depression because your whole perspective on the meaning of his suffering comes from very different than the medical perspective that we often think of. So it's really inspiring to have you on on Madness Radio, and I really encourage people to to check out your book, Lincoln's Melancholy. Now, for those of us who maybe are listening internationally or aren't so familiar with Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln is considered one of the greatest American politicians, if not the great president, leader. Um, and what were some of his extraordinary achievements, just to kind of give us a context well, the, the big story with Lincoln is that he was elected at a time of mounting conflict between the North and the South and the United States, and the conflict really centered on slavery and its future. And Lincoln was the leader of a coalition that believed that in stopping the expansion of slavery, although he was not what we would call an abolitionist, at least not at the beginning of his, of, of, of his term. But his election on an on a anti-slavery expansion platform sparked the secession of the southern states, and the Civil War began soon after. So Lincoln was a war president, and his conduct of the war, but more importantly, the philosophy of democracy, uh, an anti-slavery democracy that he laid out, really became the foundation for for the country moving forward. So even though you know, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had founded the United States formally in the late 18th century. Lincoln really became a founding father himself, and many of the of the texts that he left, including the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural Address, and and many others, um, are are foundational not only in the United States but all over the world. Uh, people read Lincoln and and consider him to be a kind of a visionary for, for what uh, a civil society can look like. And what was his background? How did he become a politician, and how did he be- eventually become president? He was a young man from the sticks. He was part of the working poor in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois. Uh, he came up as a shopkeeper and then learned the law and became a lawyer. And alongside his law career, he began... In local state politics, he became a state assemblyman and became a leader of the of the Whig Party, as it was as it was known in Illinois uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, he served one term as a United States congressman. He was a, a major uh, intellectual and, and political force in Illinois, although he was extremely obscure in the national scene until the 1850s when he he became increasingly well known for his anti-slavery positions in particular in opposition to a a guy named Stephen Douglas who was one of his nemeses uh, and was a a major uh, figure, a a United States senator and in in conflict with with Douglas and in the course of debates with him including these formal debates when they were running against each other for Senate uh, Lincoln rose to national prominence and was uh, nominated for president in 1860 and, and elected. So Lincoln really came from quite humble origins, and just because of his talent and perseverance, rose to become one of the great politicians of our of our time. It's an extraordinary story in and of itself that says a lot about democracy and the idea of people being able to just come from the grassroots and make their way into national leadership. Yeah, that's right. It's the beginning of the idea of the self-made man, and Lincoln really is the embodiment of it. And so it may be really surprising for people to hear that Lincoln was someone who struggled with what we would now call depression for his whole life. Is that right? Yes, it is surprising. It surprised me 
I started working on this story when I was in my mid-twenties, and I was living in Washington, D.C., uh, not far from the Lincoln Memorial, and that was my whole view of Lincoln, was what we see in the Lincoln Memorial, which, which is this view of a man as God. In fact, the Lincoln Memorial is designed, the model for it is a statue of Zeus on his throne, and it's very intentionally designed to create this feeling of awe in, in people who approach it. You climb up these huge marble steps, and you're in this temple, and his words are inscribed, etched in marble on the, on the walls, and this towering figure in his, in, his, in his great chair looking peaceful and wise. It was totally shocking to me when I began to encounter the story of Lincoln's depressions as a young man, which are classic depressions of despair and sorrow that's never ending and a, a, a feeling of hopelessness, uh, ruminations on suicide, and, and a real alarm in his, in his friends and community in a sense that he really was uh, in danger of killing himself to the extent that twice in his early life there were suicide watches. They took active steps to keep him from hurting himself. Alongside this, in his late 20s, Lincoln came out of the closet, so to speak, as someone who was unusually morbid in his mind and, and ruminated and, and was preoccupied. He loved to read maudlin poetry, which, you know, gave expression to the cast of his mind. And, and while, you know, sorrow and, and many of these qualities are familiar to, to any human being, Lincoln really thought that he was unusual. He thought that he had a melancholy that was, that was out of the norm. And that was the, that was the perspective of, of his friends, too. They, they thought that he was a, a very unusually depressed man. So when we hear that Lincoln was depressed, we're not just talking about he had some periods of feeling bad or feeling low, that he actually did have a very severe experience of what we would consider clinical depression or whatever phraseology you want to use it. He was really suffering to the extreme that we think of depression can be for someone. Yes, he was. And this gets to the core of of the book and what's so interesting because there are these two perspectives that we have to hold in mind simultaneously and F. Scott Fitzgerald said, you know, this is the test of a first-rate mind. Can you hold two opposing ideas in mind? The first is that the clinical perspective is valuable and that, you know, we can bring that to bear in this case and, and learn something about Lincoln and learn something about our own life. And from this perspective, if you present the facts of Lincoln's case to any modern clinician, it is absolutely unambiguous. I mean, if you just go down the criteria in the, in, the, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and you compare that against the, the very clear uh, events of, of Lincoln's depressions as a young man, it's clear that he had major depressive uh, episodes and that he had at least two of them, probably more, but at least two of them, which is enough to say this man had what we would today call major depressive disorder. The, the second perspective we have to hold in mind, though, is that this is of limited utility. The, the, the value of diagnosing someone is in leading to some kind of treatment. And Lincoln is, is not before us to be treated. Diagnosis is also a snapshot of any moment in time. And with Lincoln, we, you know, we have a whole story to tell. We have a, a whole life that he lived in front of us. And while I'm drawing in the book on modern psychiatry and psychology and, and literature and, and a whole variety of, of perspectives, sociology as well, I'm also trying to get into Lincoln's head and into, into, and into the, the perspective of the world around him so that we can learn t today from the wisdom that was embodied in his life. So this leads us to a perspective that really challenges the clinical perspective, which says, you know, the clinical perspective says, look, let's, let's identify disease so that we can treat it. And Lincoln's life suggests that we also need to identify uh, qualities of character and, and qualities of a life that, while maybe troubling, uh, maybe uh, even dangerous, also have uh, elements of value. And over the course of Lincoln's life, the, the challenges uh, of his despair were wrapped up in, in, in what made him a man uh, preoccupied with meaning, 
um, hardworking, searching in his mind for some uh, something bigger than the ordinary world around him. And this was a huge part of, of, of what led him to, to what we so appreciate about him. So we've been talking about Lincoln's depression or his melancholy kind of as a feature of his personality or his character. I'm also very interested when I hear people talk about depression, if there might be something that he was depressed about some loss or trauma or experience or hardship that he had maybe in his family or his childhood. Was there something that may have been driving him to be depressed? It's a really good question. And I have to say, we don't know. There was a significant loss in Lincoln's childhood. He, his mother died when he was a boy. Uh, his sister died in, in childbirth when he was older. I think he was a teenager at the time. His first breakdown, uh, the first time he was suicidal and re really the, the time his depression became manifest, seems to have been provoked by the death of a young woman that he knew well, was friendly with. There, there may have been some romance there, although it's entirely uncertain, but it's very clear that after her death, Lincoln went off the rails. And, and perhaps that, you know, woke in him a real tenderness around the, the death of loved ones. That said, it was, it was really a quite common uh, to, to lose a mother in that time. I think that I remember right that half of the, of the U.S. presidents in the 19th century lost a parent when they were young. So many of the things that Lincoln went through were common, and, and yet his, clearly his depression is not a, a common depression. Lincoln actually addressed this uh, directly with a, his usual acuity. He said that he, there may be particular causes of a depression, but they really only get you if you have a nervous temperament to begin with. And so he understood that, yes, there were sort of external phenomena that were relevant and that needed to be addressed. Although he didn't talk about death in the family, he was talking about things like bad weather and so forth. But you have to understand that it's the interaction between these phenomena and a, a, you know, a tender mind, someone who is vulnerable to these moods in the first place that leads someone to, you know, to where he was, which was morbidly depressed. That's interesting. So even more than 100 years later, that era was still struggling with the kind of the mystery of depression and, well, is it nature, is it nurture, is it some combination of both? We haven't really gotten much further in that conversation, it sounds like. It is the eternal conversation, and it's clear that there's a relationship between nature and nurture, and, and it's now become clear that you know, there, there's even a relationship between nature and nurture on the genetic level that this field of epigenetics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. demonstrates that it's not that we have genes or don't have genes, that it's the way that genes get activated. When Lincoln was going through this suffering, did he seek treatment? Was he trying to get his suffering alleviated? Were there kinds of doctors and different things that he did um, in his life to um, overcome his depression? The answer is yes, but let me give some context. In order to understand Lincoln's melancholy, you have to look at his life according to these distinct phases uh, that he went through. In his mid-20s, he had these major episodes. He was suicidal. He was very open about it, and he did seek treatment. And One time in particular, he was under the care of a physician, and, he, and, and that physician was doing for him the ordinary things that were done at the time, which seem, you know, bordering on barbaric now, uh, bleeding and, and leeching and mercury, which was a, these mercury pills were very common treatments for what was then under, understood to be a, a disease relating to the black bile, according to this old Greek idea of the black bile. And they thought if they could just expunge that bile from the body, that it would lead to improvements. And uh, mercury was a common treatment for that because, you, you know, when you ingest a poison, it does induced sweating and uh, defecation and all, all kinds of things that they thought were the body kind of ridding itself of the black bile. That phase of Lincoln's life ran from his mid-20s to his early 30s. And after that, he got married. He began to have children. And his melancholy did not go away, but he, he no longer was kind of public about it in the, in the, in the same way. He was not uh, frequently confessing his despair. He was not having 
these suicidal episodes, it became a much quieter, even in some ways philosophical uh, melancholy. He would sit on the side of the room for long stretches of time. People were very aware that he, that he was a melancholy man, but he was not seeking treatment. He was, it, to the extent that he was trying to get help, it was through strategies that he began to employ, like reading literature and trying to improve himself in, in his mind, trying to sharpen his mind through logical exercises, and especially telling jokes and stories, which was his primary therapy and a, a kind of self-developed therapy, although it was also very social. That was a, Lincoln would, for hours at a time, would tell these tall tales, and you know, he, he always wanted to know who had good jokes. He would soak them up, and then he would, he would recycle them. This is a Southern tradition if you go you know, down in the southern United States today, you can hear people swapping stories, and Lincoln was a real master of this. I'm curious about why that transition took place. Why did he go from someone seeking treatment to developing his own strategies and approaches and ways of dealing with it himself? I, I think about this a lot. I, I'm now 43 years old. I wrote this book from my late 20s to my mid-30s. I think that there's an element of this that is in the life cycle Young people are more voluble and more comfortable in some ways letting it all hang out. And as time passes, uh, there's a, a more resigned quality uh, with experience. Uh, uh, one comes to accept that one is not entirely alone um, and that these things need on some level to be endured. And in some ways, I think the early depressions of Lincoln's life were this kind of all or nothing thing that he thought he needed to be rid of the, of the suffering entirely or that he would have to kill himself. And there was a shift into a quieter, more subtle, even more melancholy perspective in some ways that this was his lot in life. And, and it was a matter of, you know, doing the work every day to try to, to be as good as he could, which is not the same necessarily as feeling as good as he could. And this was a, a conclusion that Lincoln came to in the, in the depth of his despair, that, that he wanted to live and he wanted to live to do something meaningful for the world that he would be remembered for. And that itself, I think, is it's, it's inspirational, but it's also there's an element of melancholy in it that he did not intend to be a happy man. Uh, he intended to do something for other people um, that would be linked to his name through the ages. So that perspective and that sort of life purpose arose from his experiences of depression and melancholy and the struggle that he went through? They're certainly related, and just in terms of story, the moment when Lincoln really laid out his, his mission in life is at the moment of the depth of his despair, and he, and he did it in a very explicit way, he told his best friend at the time, Joshua Speed, that he wanted to kill himself, that he could kill himself, but that he wasn't going to kill himself because he believed there was something meaningful for him to do in the world. If you just look at his own words, yes, there's a very direct link. Now, Lincoln was someone who was, you know, service-minded uh, from a much earlier age and had this ambition even before his depression came upon him. So I don't want to tell a simplified story, but certainly the depression is a major part of this picture. And was he religious? Did he have a spiritual or religious perspective on what he was going through and maybe why, and maybe that there was some purpose or meaning in his, his suffering as someone dealing with depression or melancholy? That's a great question and a critical one. And the last chapter of the book is devoted to Lincoln's spirituality it's absolutely integral to his story, and I think one of the things we can learn from his story is the, is the necessity of engaging a spiritual perspective alongside a medical one as we consider suffering in general and, and melancholy and depression in particular. Lincoln's story is that he was, uh, he was raised in, a, in a, a, a strict Calvinist environment, really hardcore belief in, in sinners and eternal damnation for those who are not elected for salvation. He rejected that fundamentalist, you could say, worldview, and became, in his 20s, an infidel. And that was someone who was, I mean, he was an apostate. He was, he was not necessarily irreligious, but he was extremely critical of the, the traditional religion in which he was raised. Uh, over time, though, Lincoln became more and more interested in a spiritual perspective, 
uh, he felt when he was in his deep depressions as a young man that he saw that religion could be a balm for suffering if one could believe it. He seemed to long for that kind of faith. And over time, he did develop his own very distinct and peculiar and, frankly, very hard to describe spiritual perspective. At his height was quite a sophisticated theological thinker, and there's uh, a number of, of books about Lincoln's theology. If he had done nothing else and he did many other things, this theology would be worth studying in seminary because he worked out a very complex and, and effective philosophy whereby he did deeply, deeply believe in a deity, but he also believed in the responsibility of, of man and in the, the mind of man as the kind of instrument of the divine will. So he didn't think that he was a puppet with his arms being lifted up left and right by some onboard operating system that was God. He thought that there was a, a design to the universe and that design had set his mind in motion and that it was his job to discover what he called God's will, but I think would have also been comfortable saying, you know, was, what's the right thing to do? What moves us in the direction of, of justice and, and goodness and opportunity and, and benefit for all mankind. And he was, he was fiercely committed to that, and it did bring him comfort that the suffering of his life and the suffering around him was bound up in a larger narrative of progress. Did his spiritual view give him a sense of why he was suffering so much, or there, there was some reason behind it, or was part of that divine order? Well, that, that's another great question, and, and it, at, at its core, what his, what his spirituality was about was the faith that there was some reason that he needed to discover. He once said to his law partner that suffering is educative. It has a purpose to teach us something. He believed that his own personal suffering and also the suffering of the nation, which became bound up when he was president, there were you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths in the Civil War and many, many more uh, injuries that were grievous and people maimed and losing limbs and, you know, disfigured. And, uh, and then all of the widows and the orphans of the, of the men who had died, Lincoln suffered through that, but he also believed the war had come for a purpose and that to turn away from it would be to turn away from, from this narrative of progress. It's, it's an extremely dark story. It's a really awful story in, in many ways, and, and it's easy to romanticize you know, wars that, that are a long time ago. It's easy to um, think of them as some kind of you know, romantic conflict between right and wrong and to dwell in the, in the romance that, that right prevail, but it was an extremely grim affair, and the, the private depression, the personal depression, and this, and this sort of larger question of national suffering were really entwined, and Lincoln's solution to one and, and his solution to the other were, were also entwined, that, that, that the search for meaning, the search for purpose, the search for improvement. And so even though Lincoln believed that there was purpose and meaning and some God's will or divine plan in both his own suffering and the suffering of the nation, it wasn't a resignation or an acceptance or a kind of passive perspective. There was also a very vital role for personal choice and decision and free will and effort and discipline and commitment to play in that. That's exactly right. And those two, uh, that is the dialectic, the, the combination of kind of opposites that that we need to take away from Lincoln's life. And also a sense that, look, we are not at fault here. Uh, he said that melancholy is a misfortune, not a fault. And we should not blame ourselves for our suffering. And yet we must embrace with all of our energy our responsibility to live good lives and to, and to be good to the people around us. So one of the most fascinating things about your book is how you describe Lincoln's powerful character, the qualities of his personhood that made him an incredible leader. You, you talk about how that was actually bound up in his struggle with depression itself, that it wasn't just some kind of mental flaw that he was pushing aside, but that the process of him dealing with his melancholy built and created and honed his skills and, and abilities as a statesman. Yes. Tell us about that, How, because we don't tend to think of depression as 
as doing that. We think of it as a minus on the equation of our lives, but you're saying that something much more complicated was going on with, with Lincoln. Again, we need to hold the two perspectives in mind. I mean, is it better to be depressed or not depressed? It, it's better to not be depressed. I mean, I'm literally now imagining, just as a metaphor, you know, having a weight on my shoulders. I prefer not to have it on, on it, but if that leads me to you know, press down you know, in my legs, in order to carry that weight, it's going to strengthen me over time. There is a value, and you know, we see this all through time, and, and, and arts and letters and science and matters of state, people who you know, feel the woes of their own lives most acutely, you know, develop a, may develop a kind of depth that serves them well and that serves other people well. In psychology alone, you think about great lights, and William James is, is my favorite psychologist and philosopher, and this was a man who suffered enormously and was, was trying to understand it and was trying to help himself and was, was, was trying to help other people. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and our guest today is Joshua Wolf Schenk. He's the author of Lincoln's Melancholy, How Depression Challenged a President and Fueled His Greatness. And so what were some of the qualities that Lincoln developed through the struggle with his melancholy? The things that made him feel better were, were reading and writing, which helped him connect to a world outside of his own mind and, and know that he was not alone and, and, get, and it helped give voice, it, it helped articulate what was in his heart and his mind. Um, and also these jokes and stories and this kind of, uh, this ritual of standing around a group of men, the lawyers that he was on the circuit with or the guys in town and swapping these stories. You know, it's a, kind of like a culture, if you can imagine like a stand-up comedy show, except you know, no one's on stage. It's just a, it's just a group of people kind of in a circle, and they're taking turns, uh, and they're trying to top each other. And this was also a huge part of Lincoln's life, and it, it made him a better communicator. It, ma- it made him, a, a lot, and a lot of the way Lincoln communicated, a lot of what makes his, his rhetoric so powerful is that he, you know, he could be a very high-minded philosopher, but he could also, also speak in the vernacular, he could, you know, he could tell very earthy stories, even body stories, not in, in public, but in in uh, in private. I mean, he was he would say a lot of things that would that you know mothers would want to cover their children's ears if they if they heard it. How did his melancholy drive him to be this storyteller and kind of like a stand-up persona? And oh well, it was just a very direct thing. This was this, this is what made him feel better. He said that these these stories, the vents to my moods and gloom, that they gave him relief. It was pleasurable. It's such a common story that it's a cliche, but like many cliches, it, it reflects a deep truth. You, you're either going to laugh or cry, and laughter is a a lot more fun and also something that you can join in with other people around. So it was a way for him to no longer be isolated with his suffering in a sense. That's right. And did he develop uh, courage? Because I know that facing suicidal feelings in yourself is a terrifying, terrifying thing. And then repeatedly in his life as a politician, he had to develop the courage within himself to face extraordinary challenges. Was there a connection there as well? I think so. You know, he was not rattled by the dark and the difficult and the challenging. He expected it. He was not uh, optimistic in a way that led people to delusion. He tended to look for the, the worst in any situation and, in order to grapple with it. And that was, that was certainly a lifelong habit of, of mine that sprang at least in part from his, his qualities of melancholy. You mentioned a study that was done that actually demonstrates that people who are depressed have a more realistic perspective on what's happening. Can you tell us about that? It's a classic psychological study, and it came up with this idea called depressive realism, that you know, people who are depressed are, are more likely to, to understand the truth of a situation, even if it's kind of a grim truth. People who are not depressed tend to often distort reality uh, in a way that, that makes them feel better. And there's a, the height of this perspective is um, a, a brilliant little paper that is a, a satire, but it bears a lot of truth which a psychologist says he's going to diagnose happiness as a mental disorder. And he goes through and he, and he lays out a lot of these cognitive distortions that 
happy people face. And I mean, if you go through the day not recognizing that you're going to die, not recognizing, you know, as you hurtle down the street you know, at 85 miles an hour in a multi-ton vehicle, that you are inches away from calamity. I mean, if, if you do these things that we all absolutely need to do and not to be crippled by fear, you are actually dispelling a, a, a truthful quality of the world. And obviously, people who are depressed can become crippled by these fears and these, and these realities, even if they're true. Um, but there, there is a value in it. There's value in grappling with the darkest elements of our realities. So if someone who's happy might say, well, you know, things are going to get better, but Lincoln might more realistically, from his melancholy perspective, say, well, things are bad, but they might actually get a lot worse. Which That's is, right. Which is kind of what happened with the... Civil War. I mean, it was a spiral down into an absolute horror that's, to, that's for right. him to be the president of a nation that's going to war with so much violence and to have that discipline and that courage to remain steady with his commitment must have taken an extraordinary ability to face the horrors of the situation that you're saying that maybe he learned from facing some of the horrors inside of himself. Yes, that's very well said. And were there other qualities that he developed out of his depression? You, you mentioned humility, I think. Yeah, the humility is central. Um, the sense that, you know, on some level, you know, we're not in control. And in order to get through this life, we need to capitulate to that, and recognize that. And of course, humility is, you know, very different than, you know, a nihilistic resignation. Lincoln's humility certainly at his best, was the humility that said, look, I, I am a, a very small piece in an order that's much bigger than anything I, I can comprehend, um, and yet I, ha I have my bit to do. And what do you think are some of the implications of your understanding of Lincoln's greatness being connected to his melancholy, the implications for our understanding about politicians and leadership today? Because we, we have this view that if you have any kind of mental flaw at all, you're disqualified. Um, it's seen as a flaw. It's not seen as something that might actually build your character or give you strength. I mean, for some politicians, if it comes out that you've had any kind of mental health struggles, then people aren't going to vote for you or they're not going to yes. believe that you have this capacity. What, what do you think are some of the implications of that? The big turning point in modern times was e Thomas Eagleton, who was chosen by McGovern in 1972 to be his running mate, to be the candidate for vice president. And it emerged that he had had nervous breakdowns, had been in hospitals, and had had shock therapy. And that became a, a great scandal, and he, he withdrew from the race, and it was, was radioactive from then on out for, for any political figure to have any kind of mental health profile. And to, to this day, I mean, I don't think you, you would ever see uh, a, a major political figure confessing to have been in psychotherapy. I mean, I know that Barack Obama is a big fan of Lincoln, and and I wouldn't be surprised if he had read my book, but he would never, I don't think he would ever even say that because it would just immediately kick up this firestorm of, you know, is he depressed? And in so many areas of life, we're, we're so far beyond it. We, in the arts and so many public figures can speak openly of their struggles and we can recognize that a great deal of strength may coexist with this fantastic fragility that is, you know, struggles with mental health. But in politics, it's, um, it's just entirely verboten. Their insistence on a kind of plastic, fake, relentlessly upbeat, optimistic perspective. And it's uh, a disaster. It's just leadership comes from reckoning with reality in, in, in a full way. And the, and the kind of character who can reckon with reality is, is going to be one, you know, who experiences some darkness. As constituents, we should demand this of our leaders. A friend of mine recently set, sent me something that he wrote, and he said, I want you to read it if you have time, and I want you to tell me what you like and what you hate. And he said, if you, if you don't hate any of it, I'm going to know you haven't read it. You know, we should say to our politicians, tell us, tell us about how you see the world, in it, and, and if there isn't darkness in it, we know you're lying. We're not going to believe you. We're not going to trust you, and we, and we need to shift the, the way that politicians are reported on where these scandals are made of any kind of lapse into humanity. We, we need to just take a step back and say, what will we expect? Let's say, you know, in our families, we look up to our older brothers or our fathers or our mothers, you know, 
we understand that respecting them and admiring them is not inconsistent with seeing that they're human, that they make mistakes, that they, uh, they have eccentricities, and we need to bring that same human perspective to the political realm. And is there some quote or something you'd like to read us from the book, maybe something that Lincoln himself wrote? Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, a, a letter that Lincoln wrote in December 1862. He was president. The war was raging. Um, it was actually an extraordinarily trying time for Lincoln. It seemed that the government was really falling apart. The war was turning badly. And an old friend of his from Illinois came around and asked him if he would write a condolence letter to a young woman who Lincoln had met. He knew the family. They were on the, the, the route that he traveled as a circuit lawyer. And this young woman, uh, her name was Fanny McCullough, really interesting young woman, uh, charismatic and unusually bright and very sensitive, very much like Lincoln himself uh, when he was a young man. And... Um, when her father died, the whole circle around her w was uh, extremely concerned about how she would react. And indeed, when, when they told her, she, um, she got very upset, and then she had what, what looks like a kind of psychotic break. She was, certainly became very disordered in her mind and then went to her room and wouldn't leave and wouldn't eat. And they, everyone was, you know, um, was pulling out their hair, wondering how to be helpful to her, and, and one of, a friend of the family thought that uh, a note from the president <laughs> might be a balm to her, and, if, you know, of course, these letters from, you know, politicians at moments of sensitivity are, that's a trope of, of public life, and usually they're, you know, they're form letters that are written by a, a, a speechwriter these days, or by some kind of aide. Lincoln, when he had a break, took his, his pen, and we ha actually, the original letter exists, um, and he, he wrote this letter, um, this is December 23rd, 1862. Dear Fanny, it is with deep grief that I learn of the death of your kind and brave father, and especially that it is affecting your young heart beyond what is common in such cases. Oh, and I'm going to annotate the letter a little bit as I, I read it. So he says, Beyond what is common in such cases, in other words, he understands that beyond the ordinary reaction to a father's death when you're a young woman, that this that there, that there's something special about her, her grief, and he's I think recognizing her as a as a peculiar sufferer. And he goes on, in this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young, it comes with bitterest agony, because it takes them unawares. The older have learned to ever expect it. And here he's, you know, empathizing and, and, and connecting and helping her feel uh, that this is, that it's okay to feel the way she feels and, and acknowledging the reality of her experience. And then he kind of moves towards um, the, the next beat. He writes, I am anxious to afford some alleviation of your present distress. Perfect relief is not possible except with time. You cannot now realize that you will ever feel better. Is not this so? And this is, you know, getting right to the heart of the experience of depression. If, if we felt morbid, fearful, but we knew it would pass, um, it would be an entirely different experience. So much of depression is, you know, this getting locked in this lockbox, uh, you know, from which it appears you... You, know, you have no key. You, you can't even access the, the mechanism that a key might turn in and that it, it, it feels eternal. And he, goes, he, gets, uh, he, he gets that. So he says, is, is, is not this so uh, that, that you cannot realize it, that, you, you, that you, you think you'll never feel better? And then he says, and yet it is a mistake. You are sure to be happy again. To know this, which is certainly true, will make you sound less miserable now. I have had experience enough to know what I say, and you need only to believe it to feel better at once. So this is actually very complicated uh, uh, thinking uh, and very subtle. He's saying, I'm not expecting you to feel better, 
I, but I want you to believe me that you will one day. And that itself, that belief, that faith it, it is enough for you to endure this. And so having acknowledged, having acknowledged the reality of her experience, he's, he's very gently touching on some practical points about how she can endure and, per, and, and persist. And then as the letter closes, he, he touches on something much more forward-looking. He says, the memory of your dear father, instead of an agony, will yet be a sad, sweet feeling in your heart of a purer and holier sort than you have known before. Please present my kind regards to your afflicted mother, your sincere friend. It's this last sentence um, holds out a promise of a of a certain kind of improvement, a melancholy improvement. He's not suggesting that she will be happier, but he he's suggesting that um, by access to these feelings, there there will be something pure and holier uh, that she'll have access to the sad, sweet feeling in her heart. And so having acknowledged her experience and having suggested something of how she could endure it, he's offering a, a vision of uh, what we might call transcendence, a kind of not leaving behind the woe, but the woe becoming integrated into into some you know, deeper meaning that in which we're even more connected to the world around us. So this this letter, I think, really condenses a lot of the wisdom um, of that that Lincoln achieved, and also the the wisdom of his life experience and and the value of of telling his story today. That we can see that he did these things in his life. He acknowledged his own depression. He was clear about it. He was he was not apologetic. He he articulated his you know, his innermost fears and desperation as a young man. He found ways to endure and persist, and he, you know, he had his therapies, both medical and also kind of, you know, vocational and avocational, and, and he was always looking for the larger meaning and you know, what is this really about? Why am I going through this, and, and how can I be improved in service to my fellow men? It's extraordinary just to hear his words as a writer, also the depth of his insight and, and wisdom, what he had been through personally and able to offer that about struggling with loss and depression. Could you just read the whole thing just straight through so we can hear it again? I'm glad you asked. I will enjoy reading it again. I have the same feeling about Lincoln as a writer. Dear Fanny, it is with deep grief that I learn of the death of your kind and brave father, and especially that it is affecting your young heart beyond what is common in such cases. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. The older have learned to ever expect it. I am anxious to afford some alleviation of your present distress. Perfect relief is not possible except with time. You cannot now realize that you will ever feel better. Is not this so? And yet it is a mistake. You are sure to be happy again. To know this, which is certainly true, will make you some less miserable now. I have had experience enough to know what I say, and you need only to believe it to feel better at once. The memory of your dear father, instead of an agony, will yet be a sad, sweet feeling in your heart of a purer and holier sort than you have known before. Please present my kind regards to your afflicted mother, your sincere friend, A. Lincoln. Wow, that's quite a letter. I never I never known about that. Thank you. Fanny McCullough, I mean, this letter has been very well known for, uh, you know, for, for generations. Uh, that One of the contributions my book made to the scholarship is is digging out her story i found letters in an archive that give context we knew that she was troubled and that you know she was part of this family and we knew about her her dad but the details of her emotional life are just are amazing 
and electrifying and the and the resonance with 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 Lincoln as as a as a young man is is really potent and that's that's something that uh, your your listeners can find it in my book if they're if they're curious. In having studied Lincoln's depression and, and melancholy, what do you think are some of the personal lessons that people might get about their own depression? Well, the big story is to look at the arc of Lincoln's life and these three things that he did uh, over the course of his life. Number one, acknowledge his depression. He was very open about it. Um, he was not ashamed of it, even though he, he struggled with it. He sought help. He let his community know that he was suffering, and that, that I think made a big difference, that he, he saw that he would not be exiled, that he would be, that he could be supported. And that's also a message to, I think, those of us who are caring for people who are suffering is to um, not shame them and to, to do what we can to support them. So that's the first thing I think is, is acknowledgement. And, I, and the second thing is to recognize that acknowledgement and expression of suffering it, at some point that we do all of that that we can do and we need to build a better life for ourselves and look for some sense of, uh, of, of purpose and, and work and you know, just do the, the daily stuff to be better people and be of service and, and experience whatever joys we can experience. And I think the third major thing is then to, you know, to bind up this recognition of who we are and how we suffer and whatever capacities we develop day to day and some larger purpose that looks beyond the self and looks beyond our own limited lives and uh, looks to what we can contribute to the world around us. And indeed, if we're thinking grandiosely, which I'm certainly want to do, uh, you know, to think about how we can, you know, what we can offer to humanity and to history. And do you think that there's a lesson from your book to the medical establishment in terms of their approach to depression? Definitely. Holding the clinical perspective in mind alongside this humanistic perspective, I think, is one. Learning to look at people as stories and not uh, simply as patients is another. The value of a, of a biographical perspective on depression is, is that we get to see the whole life. And, you know, if you're looking at a 20-year-old person, you know, who's suffering from major depression, you can see that person is in the midst of a story and, and help, help the patient see that, too. There are many changes yet to come. And so your book, Lincoln's Melancholy, was written in 2005. What are some of the other projects you've been involved in since then? I published a piece in The Atlantic in 2009 that the headline was What Makes Us Happy, probably the best received thing I've ever written. It's about a longitudinal study at Harvard. It uh, began in the late 30s. They got a group of sophomores, about 180 of them, uh, who were by a bunch of measures, the, the healthiest kids they could find, uh, you know, were doing well on, on, uh, in school and, and, and all kinds of things. And they began to throw at them every conceivable test. The idea was that by studying exceptionally healthy young men, they might learn something about health. And through ups and downs and all kinds of drama, the study has persisted. And these men have been followed uh, all the way through their lives. At the time I wrote the piece, about a third of them were living the basic takeaway is that the, these guys who are about as fortunate as, as any population you can imagine in human history, they, white men, most of them, you know, Protestant. The question is not, you know, about the absence of trouble, but because trouble came to all of them. And, and the question becomes, how did they respond to it? What makes a meaningful and good life are our strategies in response to difficulty, not the level of difficulty itself. And so this longitudinal study about happiness, what were some of the conclusions about the strategies that these very privileged men use to make it through troubles in their lives? There are a series of responses to difficulty that, that every human being is employing virtually all the time. If you look at the least healthy adaptations, I mean, these, these are, are the things that we, this is what mental illness is may sound pejorative, but I think it's actually enormously empathetic and, and humanizing to say, look, people who are you know, in psychosis, for example, are, are really doing their, the best they can to cope with something that's overwhelming to them. And, and I'm not discounting the extent to which it's a biochemical event and, and all this, but that there is on some level a strategy being employed. And if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum and see people who are 
in service, um, who uh, are, are funny, who find ways to sublimate, which is, you know, kind of taking their energy and channeling it into work or to some kind of cause. This is what we, what we most admire, but that all the way through from the least healthy to the most healthy and everywhere in between, people are employing the strategies of these adaptations. Humor, sublimation, altruism, and suppression, uh, which might sound a little funny on that list, but it, suppression is when you, it's different from repression, when you push something away. Suppression is when you, you see something happening and you just make a choice without stuffing it down. You make a choice to step away from it in the moment. Um, but, you know, I think humor and sublimation and altruism are, are, are the big three. Mm, that's what produced the long-term happiness for these people. Well, yeah, and you know the study. I think what makes us happy. It's it, this is not happiness as positive affect. This is this is about a good life. This is about the the qualities of the people who we most admire and, and whose lives we we most aspire to. And what are you working on now? So I just published a book called Powers of Two, and it's uh, a study of uh, relationships and creativity. And uh, I've, I'm just coming off you know, promoting that nonstop for months and digging into a new project. It's a, a book-length essay about money and identity and the way that um, things and you know, material things and our emotional lives become entwined. I'm looking at that through my own life and my own family history. It's ultimately, I mean, all, all these, these topics are on, on some level about kind of the psychological experience and, and about my trying to work out through my work, critical questions about how to live. I wrote a book about depression. It was, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you think about depression? I wrote a book about relationships and, and now I'm writing a book about how to live in the material world, um, with sanity and, and good health and, and, and how to integrate what resources we have or, or don't have into a meaningful and good life. We are just about out of time. So remind us about your book and your also your new book and how people can get in touch with you. My website is uh, my last name, which is S H E N K dot net, or you could just Google my name, Joshua Wolf Shank. We've mostly been talking about Lincoln's melancholy. You can find more about it on my website. My most recent book is called powers of two and uh, the, the piece that we, we discussed briefly um, is also available online from the Atlantic magazine. It's called What Makes Us Happy. And I would love to hear from your listeners. They can email me on my website, join my mailing list, and um, I write to everyone who writes me. So I would be glad to be in touch. Joshua Wolf Shank, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Hey, thank you. You're, you're a terrific conversation partner. I really, uh, I really uh, got a lot out of it. You've been listening to an interview with Joshua Wolf Shank. He's the author of Lincoln's Melancholy, How Depression Challenged a President and Fueled His Greatness. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.